Ladies and gentlemen, Marla Runyon. All right, thank you so much. Anybody been watching Winter Olympics by chance? Yeah? Anybody watch the, uh, the hockey game the other night? A little heartbreaker there? All right, um, anyway, um, I love, obviously, the Olympics and uh, love watching the Winter Olympics. I sit very close to the TVs, my, you know, a few inches away so I can see what's going on. And um, I'm totally in awe of what Olympians can do, especially in the Winter Olympics. Um, watched the skeleton recently, okay? I, I have to admit that I really didn't know the difference between luge, skeleton, bobsled, until just a few days ago, and I'm watching our American uh, woman in the skeleton, and I'm thinking, okay, 80 miles an hour on a sled with your face three inches from the ice. Okay, all right. And one mistake, what, you, you die? I mean, what, 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 I mean, it's like, I'm a runner, right? So like, you, if you, if you, and running is not easy by any means, right? But, like, if I go out for a run and I'm having a bad day, I can stop running, okay? <laughs> but, but you're on the skeleton and you're having a bad day. Well, anyway, it's amazing. I'm I completely blown away by I, I love watching the Olympic Games. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I have been to Minneapolis before. I actually ran the Twin Cities Marathon in 2006. Thank you. Yay! <laughs> Yay! Um, and that marathon is particularly special to me. Um, I'm going to tell you why. It was my last competitive race. So I retired after I ran Twin Cities. It's also special because I won. <laughs> um, um, I, I'm going to get, now give you the behind the scenes story of my Twin Cities Marathon experience. Um, Twin Cities Marathon in 2006 was on October 1st um, of 2006, exactly 13 months to the day of the birth of my daughter. So I ran the marathon 13 months after she was born. Um, now, how many moms are in the room today? A lot of parents, moms? Okay, so all the men, I'm gonna make you feel really uncomfortable for a few minutes. But I was still nursing my daughter. And here I come to, to Minneapolis. I have not slept through the night. You know, as many of all new parents know, you don't typically sleep through the night when you have a new, new baby. Um, and now for moms who have nursed their children, we all know what that feels like when you wake up in the morning. Okay? So I'm getting ready. It's 5 o'clock in the morning. I've got a 7 a.m. start, marathon start. Usually, you're thinking, I really hope I run well. I hope I win. You know, you're, I'm thinking, I hope I can fit into my uniform. <laughs> so I, you know, I did fit into my uniform uh, eventually and uh, got myself to the starting line and had my husband was there and, and we had a, someone else helping us with my, our daughter, Anna. Now, let me tell you a little bit about when I'm running because people are always asking, well, what do you see? When you run, how, how do you run a marathon? Do you use a guide? A lot of questions. So, um, no, I don't use a sighted guide when I run. Um, I have enough vision to see, you know, I, it's hard for me to gauge. I'm so accustomed to my vision now. My acuity, my visual acuity is about 2300 in both eyes. Um, I am very light sensitive. So, uh, you know, the, what, the weather does make a difference, a sunny day versus a cloudy day. Um, you know, I have... A, a good proof, I have a good lower field, so I kind of see the ground. It doesn't look the way it would look to someone with normal 2020 vision, but I, I see the ground. And I have, you know, in, in a, from about here to about 10, 15 feet, I have a general good, a, a relatively good idea of what's in front of me. <laughs> we'll go with that. And as I run, my little bubble of vision follows me, right? So I don't know what's at the end of this room. But if I run there, I'll know when I get there. So in a sense, as I move through space, I piece by piece by piece, I put my environment together 
and sort of create, you know, my picture of, of the world or of my environment. So anyway, I'm, I'm off in Twin Cities, and um, I don't have a guide runner. I am always a little concerned that, gosh, I hope I stay on the course and I don't go the wrong way. But typically, major marathons, are the courses are marked relatively well. You know, you're not going to run off. If you run off the course, you're running into the crowd or something like that. Um, the one thing I cannot see are clocks on the course. And every runner knows that time is everything. Time is everything to a runner. We're all about our splits. We're all about our pace. So I went to Twin Cities. My, my best marathon before Twin Cities was two hours, 27 minutes, 10 seconds in New York, which averages out to about five minutes and 37 seconds per mile for the marathon, which is 26.2 miles. Now, since I just had a baby, I figured, okay, if I could run 545 per mile, that would be great. So I gave myself a little wiggle room, you know, since I had just given birth. Anyway, so I said, you know, 545, that's around a 230 marathon, right? two hours 30. So I can't see the clocks, though. I, I, in fact, it's very frustrating because I can get out there and actually see the structure of these clocks because they're huge. They're four feet wide. They're usually elevated off the pavement on the side, and I'm thinking, you know, um, there's the clock, and oh, and I can't see it. Damn. You know, and I really want to know what my time is. So when I had spoken with the race coordinator before coming, he said, don't worry, Marla. I'm going to have volunteers at each clock, and they're going to just be yelling out the time as you run by. And I went, um, okay, that's never going to work, but okay, I'll, I'll go, go with that. And so head off, you know, we, we start, the race starts. Men and women start together. Mass start, off we go. And get to, I know I passed mile one because I can sense the structure that I, of the clock. I'm like, okay. And I'm waiting for that person to say, you know, 540 or whatever my mile split is, and I hear, way to go, good job, keep it up, way to go. And I'm like, but what was my time? You know, I, I want to know my time. So then I get to mile two, and I'm like, okay, they're going to tell me my time. Here we go, mile two. And, and, and I'm like running here, and there's the clock, and there's the volunteer. Way to go, good job, keep it up, you can do, what was my time? You know, so I never got my time. So the other thing is, when I had spoken with the race coordinator ahead of time, you know, I don't have a guide runner, but, you know, I, in a, in a previous marathon in New York, there was a guy on a bike trailing me. Like, he couldn't be in front of me because that would be considered pacing. He had to be behind me at all times, and he would just make sure I was safe, I wasn't going to run off the course, and he could read me times and so forth. But they said, you know, we're not that, when I came to Twin Cities, like, oh, we're not that big of a marathon, so we're not going to be able to do that for you. Okay, I said, that's okay. Do you have a lead, you know, motorcycle for, you know, there's a lead motorcycle for men, lead motorcycle for women. He says, well, we have a lead motorcycle for the men. We have a bicyclist for the women. I'm like, all right, all right, you know, I'm not going to get into the discrimination of that one, but we'll go with that. Lead bicycle for the women. So I came to the conclusion after that phone call, I have to lead the race. That's how I'm going to have to run this. I have to lead the race, because that's the only visual cue I'm going to have. If I can be as close to that bicycle as I can, then I can just focus on running and not worry about going the wrong way. OK, so I'm out there, two miles, three miles, four miles. There's no bike. Where's the bike? And I'm running, and now the, the, the field has thinned out. I don't. There's a few men around me, you know, and, and we're running along, and all of a sudden I hear a couple people, you know, chatting behind me. And, you know, and I'm running, and I'm, you know, and I'm like, what? People chatting? Like, how was your weekend? I don't know. What'd you do? I don't know. And I look behind me, and there's, there's a guy on a bike and a woman on a bike having a conversation right behind me. And I, I said, um, you know, I'm running 540 per mile. Excuse me. Are you the lead bike? Yes. Do you think you could come up here and lead? Please. <laughs> so finally, around the five mile, one of them came up, and we had that lead bike. OK, the story's almost over, I promise. Running along, 
Still don't know my time. I'm running along, and I get to the 10-mile mark. I'm actually, right before I hit the 10-mile mark, I run up next to this a guy. And I'm like, great. And we're kind of running the same pace. I'm like, great. He's got a watch. So we, we hit the 10-mile mark together. And he clicked his watch. And I'm like, what was our split? And he goes, no inglés, no inglés. <laughs> Great. Okay. All right. So, off I go. I'm like, you know what? I am going to win this damn thing. And I was so mad at that point. So, off I, I just charge forward, charge forward. Here I go. Got to the halfway point, 13.1 miles. Don't know how my husband did this. He somehow found somebody to give him a ride. It's as if he knew what was happening out there. And he got himself to the halfway mark, and I hear my split, 14, or what, um, 1435, and it was my husband's voice. And that was the first split I got. I'm like, okay, well, I'm actually around like, two, I'm on 229 pace. Okay, that's not too bad. And so then, you know, off I go, running, running, and then you, you head up a little bit of a hill at about 19 miles. You crest the hill, and you've got 10K to go, six miles. And that's where the pain really sets in, if you'd never run a marathon before, okay? It's like 20, they always say 20 miles is like the halfway mark, which, because it feels like it. So I'm thinking I'm first female, oh yeah, I've got the lead bicycle up there, and uh, finally, charging forward, um, come, it's a drop finish, straight down, like this hill out of nowhere, and I'm just half delirious, dehydrated, low blood sugar, trying with my 2300 vision to focus on the back tire of that bike that just before the finish line turns off. So uh, what do I do? I turned off into the crowd. <laughs> no, Marla, no. And I jump back on the course and then there's the finish line and I won. <laughs> Anyway, and just, just as I cross the finish line, my, the, the woman who was watching my daughter hands her to me and says, she wants to nurse. I said, I'm, I'm closed. I'm not available. <clears throat> anyway, so it was, a, it was a very special race because, like I said, that was my last competitive race, and uh, I moved on um, to be, focus on being a mom, focus on being a teacher, and... Um, but it is, a, it is a, definitely a moment in my life I'll never forget. And a great story to go on top of that. <clears throat> well, I'll tell you a little bit about my childhood and, my gro and growing up. I was actually born with normal vision. So I grew up in Southern California. I have an older brother, Grady, who's two years older than me. We were a pretty outdoorsy family, you know, soccer kids, played soccer, did gymnastics the whole deal, you know, outside. We had a pool at our house. We're outside doing flips into the swimming pool. Uh, we would go to Lake Mead, go water skiing in the summer. And there was really no indication or sign or that there would ever be something wrong with my, my eyesight. Until the first day of school in the fourth grade, I had just spent the whole summer, you know, playing outside walked into my classroom, sat at my desk, and the teacher started writing on the chalkboard. And I looked up, and I couldn't make out what she was writing. And I, the first thought that came to my head was, um, what is wrong with her chalk? Because I, th there's nothing up there. She's writing, and I'm seeing a few lines, and I don't know what that is. But then I look around the room, at my classmates, and they're like, you know, copying what she wrote, and, and I'm realizing that something's not right. So feeling like I'm falling behind, I started to cry. And my fourth grade teacher took me outside and said, Marla, what's wrong? And I said, well, I can't see the board. And that was the beginning, a beginning of a two-year journey to figure out why I was losing my vision. 
the answer seems so simple, doesn't it? The, my teacher calls my mom. Marla needs glasses. So simple, right? So off we go a week later to the local optometrist. And he does the, you know, is this better or is this better? One or two or what are they, you know, back and forth. And I just said, um, neither, <laughs> neither. Uh, there wasn't a lens he could put in front of either eye that was going to help me see that eye chart any better. And he looked right at my mom and said, I don't know what's wrong with your daughter's vision. You need to go see someone else. So off to Los Angeles we drive, and this time another optometrist who did another series of tests, including peripheral vision and visual acuity depth perception tests. I did very poorly on all these tests because I had such a hard time fixating centrally because I was losing my central vision that it became even difficult to test my peripheral vision. Well, he looked into my eyes. He could not see the scars that were forming of, from star guards. And he just said to my mom, I think your daughter is making this up. And my, my mom felt, as I can imagine now as a mom, devastated because she felt, what did I do wrong? Why would my daughter make this up? And my mom later on would say to me, you know, I believed him for five minutes. And then we went to see somebody else. And so off to this time to a retina specialist. And this is obviously months and months and months of our journey. The retina specialist took a much deeper look into my retinas. And off to the first appointment, he sent me outside the room and spoke only to my parents. And so I never knew what that conversation was until much later, because I was nine years old. And when my parents came out of that doctor's office, I couldn't see the expressions on their face, but I could feel that something very serious had just been discussed. They were so quiet. And I wouldn't know for many years time later that what, had actually, what that doctor had actually told them. And what he said was, I believe your daughter has buster a butterfly dystrophy, and she will become totally blind within three months. So a completely different diagnosis, clearly. But, he said, we need to do further testing. So for two weeks, my parents lived with the belief that I was going to lose all my vision. Meanwhile, I was going to soccer practice. I was going to school. I was like, hey, I can do it. I just got to work a little harder. I just have to get closer to things. I can do it, Mom. Finally, we had all this further testing. And we have to wait for the results of those tests. And my parents go back to Los Angeles. And he says, Mr. and Mrs. Runyon, I am sorry. I am the second doctor to misdiagnose your daughter. She has Stargardt's disease, which is a juvenile form of macular degeneration. So she's going to lose her central vision and her acuity, but she's going to retain peripheral vision. And so for my parents, under the circumstances, this was something of good news. This was good news in a way, because bef just, you know, what they were just told alternatively was much worse. And the doctor then at that point said, well, you need to know. She's, she's probably going to be an average student. She probably won't go to college. She can't play sports. She won't be able to drive. And on and on he went. He, he never mentioned I couldn't run in the Olympics. So, <laughs> hey, you know. But, you know, but he, he, he and I believe, I don't want to be too hard on him, but, but I believe he had the right intentions. But I think he was trying to be honest and prepare my parents for what he thought my future was going to be. But a diagnosis is not a prognosis of how somebody is going to function. Because what he didn't know, he didn't know me. And he was really speaking beyond his scope. So many, many months, or maybe even a year later, 
it was when my mom revealed to me that conversation with the retina specialist. And she did say to me, my vision at that point was 2200. I was classified legally blind by that point. Um, and my mom says to me, I'm sitting on the kitchen counter and my mom's doing the dishes. And she says, you know, Marla, the doctor said you're legally blind. So I was like, Mom, I am not. No, what are you talking about? And then she told me all the things he said. I was, was going to be a C student, not drive, and so forth. And I remember jumping off that kitchen counter, running to my bedroom, and feeling so mad. I said, I, I, in my 10-year-old mind, I decided on that moment that I was going to spend every day proving him wrong. And you wouldn't think a 10-year-old would feel that, but a 10-year-old can feel that. And so it was almost like the next day I got up with this drive and competitiveness that I had to prove myself because my parents didn't know what to expect from me. They didn't want to be disappointed. They didn't want to, they didn't know if they should hold the same expectations for me as they did when I had full vision. And they just didn't know. And so I felt the expectations fall. And I felt it at home. I felt it in school. I heard, Marla, just do the best, and go to school. Marla, here, you go. just go do the best you can. Here's your worksheet. You know, do the best you can. No. I don't want to do the best I can. What if my best is pretty damn good? So I became very, very competitive and intense. And it was like putting fuel on the fire. I was probably already pretty competitive. I had an older brother. But it was putting fuel on the fire. And that was my reaction to my blindness. It was, I can do it. And I saw, I loved it, I loved it, it was in the video. I can do this, I just have to do it a little differently. But I can do this. And that was my approach. That was my approach to everything, to school, to athletics, to everything, to living independently. Well, way back then, this is 1978, and we didn't have computers, and we didn't have the internet, and we didn't have iPads. I told my daughter, yeah, we didn't have iPads when I was a kid. What? No iPad? You know, <laughs> yeah, believe it or not, no iPad, no iPhone. The phones were connected to the wall with a cord. My, mom, my daughter's like, what? What? The phone was connected to the wall? Why? Why? <laughs> we didn't have the technology back then. And my school district, quite honestly, did not know what to do with me. And there was my mom sitting at our kitchen counter with the yellow pages and a phone. And she would look and search and search for any resource that she thought could help me, any, any resource. I don't even know to this day how she did it. But she found some of my school textbooks in large print. She found me a globe magnifier that I would sort of cradle in my right eye and then like drag, I had to hold the book so close, I could only read with one eye. And so I would read with my glow magnifier and she tried to get me a monocular to see the chalkboard, although that never really worked that well. But she was relentless. She was a relentless advocate for me. And what she was doing, not, not in the fact that she was just providing me with tools, she was modeling for me, you can do this, you just have to do it differently. And I, I don't think at that time I could have really truly appreciated it, now I can. But to think that she was gonna find a way, that was her goal. And she taught me to find my way. So thanks to my amazing mom. 